Welcome everybody to our webinar. There lived in the town of Pethor near the Euphrates, a wizard named Balaam, so talented in his art that some have actually called him a prophet. So King Balak hired him to curse the children of Israel. For millennia, poor Bilam, son of Beor, has been much aligned owing no doubt in part to his implication in the earliest recorded case of road rage when he smote his ass after she crushed his foot against the wall. Three times he beat the beast. But as one commentator has noted, the Balaam story is one of the few redeeming sections in what has to be considered one of the least exciting books of the Bible. Now, I think our special guest today would perhaps disagree with that assessment of the Book of Numbers. I am very happy to welcome to today's webinar on linguistic coherence, um, Dr. Lenart Direct. Welcome, Lenart. Thank you so much. It's Do you uh, agree wonderful. With that? Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. It's uh, wonderful uh, to have been invited for this, and thank you so much to Drew and Harry and other organizers for having me uh, on, for this meeting with you all. Thank you. We look forward to seeing your wizardry when it comes to discourse analysis <coughs> and biblical Hebrew. Now, um, Dr. Lenard Direct is Global Translation Advisor with United Bible Society, <coughs> Societies with special responsibility for Bible translation projects in Europe and the Russian Federation. He is research fellow at the, Depart the Hebrew Department of the University of the, the Free State, Bloemfontein, and affili affiliated researcher at, um, at the Free University of Amsterdam. He has co-directed doctoral dissertations and been on dissertation communities at um, the Free University of Amsterdam and at the Faculty of the Protestant Theology at the University of Strasbourg. Welcome again. I think we're just going to go ahead and jump straight in here. Um, if you want to go ahead and share your screen with us, Leonard, All right, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm hoping you can help dispel um, for us what is linguistic coherence. So go ahead and get your, your slide up here. Now, when I was taking Latin in high school, when we acted up, when we were naughty in my Latin class in high school, my Latin teacher had a chair in the room that was called coherence. And we would have to go sit in this chair so that he could say that we were incoherent while we were misbehaving in Latin class. Now, can you just clear up for us a little bit? Um, what is linguistic coherence? What do we mean by this? All right. Um, first, I cannot res resist the temptation when you talk about the chair in the classroom that, that my teacher of English, he once put his chair on top of the table to literally demonstrate the preposition on in English, that it really meant on top of something on the table. So I have now, I now have that picture on my mind of, of my teacher of English sitting on the table. And then he continued to teach the rest of the lesson from that desk, from the table, as if it was the most normal thing in the world. So these kind of experience, they, they remain with you. I fully agree with you. Yeah. Um, so let's try to dispel some of the uh, incoherence and, and indeed going to linguistic coherence. And I thought the best thing in, to start to, to start with is indeed to 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 try to answer the question, if that's possible, on one slide: um, what is linguistic coherence and what is linguistic coherence in texts in particular? Um, I'm interested in the relations in a sentence and um, beyond sentence level between informational elements in a text that make the text, the text function as one text for the addressee, for the reader, that he realizes this is one text, this is not just a set of completely disconnected sentences, including also the segmentation of a text into paragraphs. Um, Paragraphs, beginning of paragraphs may seem to be a break, but even when we go into a new paragraph, we still sense that it is not something completely new that is starting, but a new section, a new segment of that same text. So in that sense, even segmentation of a text into paragraphs is part of linguistic coherence in texts. 
a very important part of already the working definition of linguistic coherence in texts is the balance between presupposed information on the one hand and new or unexpected information on the other. The idea that all the time the, the speaker or the writer is relying on the idea that the addressee already is in the possession of certain knowledge of certain information. The speaker presupposes that information on the part of the addressee. And at the same time, he goes on to correct the or add to the presupposed information by adding new and unexpected information that he, the speaker, considers the most relevant right now for the uh, addressee. And this continual process is, of course, what makes a text linguistic coherent. For each and every part of linguistic coherence during this presentation, we, of course, we can ask the question, um, what does it mean for, for translation? One thing is to understand how it works in Hebrew texts. Uh, another question, of course, is how we can re-express that linguistic coherence in such a way that uh, our texts in the target language when we translate will also have the same degree of linguistic coherence and will also show um, the same kind of distinction between what is presupposed information on the one hand and what is new or unexpected information, the continually added new information on the other. Because that balance, as we have between biblical Hebrew texts, is difficult to preserve, I believe, in, in translation, and we have to be on our guard uh, against losing some of that in translation. That's a quick, maybe not so quick, working definition of linguistic coherence in texts. Right. Um, I'm also interested in my work in, in exploring the, the various strategies that are employed in texts. Of course, for our subject in particular, biblical Hebrew texts, strategies towards to achieve linguistic coherence. You can think of, in particular, participant reference devices, choice of verb forms, word order patterns. For example, is there inversion of the verb, moving the verb to another place in the sentence or not? And what we often refer to as key terms, but I would immediately want to say, it isn't just about checking the key terms, but just as important, what's the impact of some individual words, excuse me for a moment, and what's the impact of word play in the uh, context in, in which they occur, or in the book in which they occur. Um, before I forget, one example would be, take the word zera. In translation, we tend to think, okay, how have we translated the word zera all across the texts in the Old Testament? Uh, and then the question is, would it mean, would we have to translate seed or offspring of descendants or something else? That's important, but what I'm much more interested in now in terms of linguistic coherence is how the word would be used uh, and what effect it would have on its immediate context in different parts of one book. And when you do that, for example, for Genesis, you discover that uh, when you check Zera, that I think it's in Genesis 16, that's the, the place where it's the only time in the book of Genesis that um, Zera, uh, in terms of uh, multiplicity of descendants, that Zera is actually promised not to one of the patriarchs, but to a woman, and that that woman is Hagar. We might expect the woman to be Sarah, but she never gets that promise. Instead, Hagar receives that promise of, of Sarah, the only woman in Genesis. That kind of observation we can make when we actually look into the impact of some words, their lexical meanings, and in other cases, wordplay, on their immediate context or on the context of, of um, a whole book. To continue with these strategies towards linguistic coherence, particles um, like achain in Isaiah 53 uh, verse 4, um, the well-known verse, yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. What does achain actually do there? Um, I think it, it marks, it introduces this unexpected new information. And in what is often the traditional English translation, where this sentence would start with 
surely it was our sickness and so on. I think that translation would be misleading. It would surely treat Achein as if it's introducing presupposed information. I think when you analyze the linguistics of that passage, um, this part of verse four is actually about unexpected information, correcting the presupposed information on the part of the reader, meaning that Achein, also when you study how Achein as a particle is used elsewhere, actually introduces a contrast. Um, so yet, nevertheless, however, would be better renderings in English. Okay, continuing with my strategies towards linguistic coherence, non-chronological arrangement should be mentioned here as well. Uh, of course, Hebrew can make use of flashbacks. Uh, um, examples are um, the prophet Obadiah and Mephibosheth in 1 Kings 18 and 2 Samuel 4. The point about that in, 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 in terms of our subject today is that it's interesting to see that the information is not mentioned where it happened chronologically, but where it is the most effective for what the author wants to convey. So non-chronological arrangement, in spite of what the term may suggest, is not about incoherent arrangement. Non-chronological arrangement can actually be extremely coherent and and to the coherence of the text. Now, these strategies, you can study them in their own right, and we often tend to do that. But thinking of linguistic coherence, I'm interested in, in how these different strategies, how they work into each other, how they occur or don't occur together in a sentence or in a paragraph. Because for each of these, we can observe that they have something in common. For each of these strategies, there are default formulations, unmarked strategies, as opposed to non-default marked strategies. And the um, so for default, it would mean uh, what happens in a sentence is mentally in the proximity of what is expected on the part of the addressee that he knows. The text progresses naturally without any discontinuity, whereas with non-default or marked forms of some of the strategies that I mentioned, the, case, the point is that um, what is mentioned is not mentally in the proximity of where the addressee is at the moment. There is discontinuity, something turns up that is unexpected, that is contrasted, and back to discontinuous, you could say also in terms of segmentation, a new paragraph, when that happens, segmentation, what takes place is a kind of reset. And that is seemingly for a moment incoherent, something new is starting. Although overall, as I said, even a new paragraph is part of a linguistically coherent text. But the point is, at the moment when a paragraph, for example, begins, well, there's an unusual pattern of some of the strategies that I mentioned. There is a sense of discontinuity, of non-proximity, it's a kind of reset. Take, to take one of the strategies, very important one, and many of us in translation, as we can all observe, uh, are rightly interested in this, word order patterns. Generally, I know this is all a quick summary, of course, but generally in, in Hebrew, certainly in narrative, in a sentence, older information is mentioned first, new information is mentioned later. That would be the default word order, meaning that the verb comes first, other parts come next. You see that in the well-known sentences about uh, Hanoch, about Enoch. Um, Hanoch et uh, Enoch walked with God. That it's about Enoch and that he walked may not be so surprising. That it was with God that he walked is the new information. This is, of course, opposed to unusual, marked, reversed order, verb second or even third, where other parts of the sentence come first to express restrictive, chronostic focus on that first mentioned part of the sentence and ruling out alternatives, which is a very important criterion to determine whether there is contrastive focus or not, is, a, is an alternative being ruled out. At the same time, the verb expresses discontinuity. 
And this, of course, is what you see in Genesis 6, 9. It's only a few verses after what we read about uh, Hanoch, about Enoch. Et ha Elohim et haleich Noach. And seemingly, the same statement is, is made about Noah here that was made about uh, Enoch a few verses earlier. But as you see, there is a crucial difference. Here it says the construction is with God walked, walked Noah. Um, why would the word order be so different here? It is here, in the case of Noah, that the statement is mentioned about, is given about him that he walked with God in contrast to his generation which is literally mentioned uh, in the sentences before this statement in Genesis 6, 9. So explicitly, uh, the word order rules out alternatives. Um, and um, the others do not walk with God, but it is with God that Noah walks. He does not follow in the footsteps of his generation. And clearly an alternative is ruled out. And here I'm mentioning again my example from Isaiah 53, 4a. This time not only because of the interesting particle achen, marking uh, unexpectedness and a correction of the presupposing formation. It is also the case, of course, that uh, our sickness and he um, are put under contrastive focus, that he is bearing those and that it's our suffering that he endured as opposed to what you would have expected by default that this figure in Isaiah 53 was simply um, carrying his own sicknesses and his own sufferings. But instead of that, it is our sufferings and our sicknesses that um, he was bearing. So both, and a point that I would make is that there is default, there is, sorry, there is, um, marked word order and that can be explained in terms of the need to rule out alternatives and at the same time there is a discontinuous verb katal instead of vayektol both the word order and the verb can and should be explained i believe their choices in their own right so I would not be in favor of, of an argument that says, um, you hear people say that sometimes, or maybe I should say, one could, one could in the past hear people say that. Um, the argument, um, the verb has to be a katal in these cases like Genesis 6, 9 and Isaiah, 50, and Isaiah 53, because um, it doesn't occur at the beginning and therefore it cannot be a vayektol, that may in itself be true. But I'd rather explain both the word order, its uh, marked word order, and uh, the verb choice as such, each in their own right. And then at the end of that, we can see that both strategies, although they seem to work separately, they also match each other and they together work towards the linguistic coherence of this sentence and of this part of um, the text and how the sentences are related to their context in terms of the balance between um, presupposed information and the new unexpected maybe contrastive information um, another example um, of contrastive word order due to contrastive focus is the sentence uh, in genesis 37 um, uh, I'm looking for my brothers. Of course, there is the et achai, my brothers, is mentioned first. It's marked word order. And why would that be the case? Um, not only is it the question, is the idea that um, the question was, who are you looking for? So that might um, inspire the speaker to put the achai, my brothers, at the beginning of the sentence. But more importantly, in terms of at least my approach to linguistic coherence, et achai rules out alternatives. He is not looking for anything or anybody else, but specifically, I'm looking for my brothers. So then you mention them at the beginning. In English, the sentence could be paraphrased as follows, for example, it is my brothers that I'm looking for. And 
on the face of it, the same may be found in Genesis 17, 14, um, where it says, Edriti, coming first, Hefa, verb second. He has broken my covenant. Um, um, but of course, there is no alternative that has to be ruled out here. Um, given the preceding verses, my covenant is already known information. It's actually the rest of the sentence, hefar, that gives new information about it. The most prominent information tending to come at the end of the sentence in Hebrew, the prominent new information is that concerning the covenant we were talking about, he has broken it. Since new, no alternatives, sorry, since no alternatives have to be ruled out, there is nothing else to break, as it were. The covenant is not contrastive information. Rather, it is just the basis for the rest of the sentence. Basis being the term um, for the first constituent in a word order like this, where the verb comes second, because the verb expresses the new salient information. The basis is uh, the, the covenant at Briti in this case, the basis being mentioned first, not because it's contrastive, because no alternative had to be ruled out. For that, I will use the term basis, but to make a remark in terms of making a connection with termin terminology used by uh, others in the field, I think that Randall Booth would refer to at Briti in this case as the contextualizing constituent, which may be a helpful term too. Um, moving on to um, a quick summary of uh, participant reference devices and verb forms then. Um, I think, again, there are parallels between these two strategies for linguistic coherence. Um, in both cases, as indeed in the case of the other strategies, uh, there is a difference between what is default and what is marked. Participant reference. Um, the default is that less material is needed because the information concerning the participant, the persons the text is talking about and referring to, is more predictable, is highly accessible, as opposed to low accessibility, where we would say something is formulated in a marked way. More material is spent on referring to a certain person in the text the reference would even be over specific and this would be done um, when a special characterization is made of the participant when the participant is mentioned unexpectedly or or he says or does something that is unexpected or climactic or it's emphasized and indeed um, segmentation we can observe that at the beginning of a new paragraph, there is a tendency in Hebrew to um, mention the participant fully with more material, that is to say, by name, not just with a pronoun. Again, as I said, this is marked in the sense that when segmentation takes place, a new paragraph is starting, it is a kind of reset. And um, you can observe that already in the case of Genesis 1, Elohim is repeated as such. God is mentioned um, by term, by name, repeatedly, not to avoid confusion, because there is no other participant yet in any case, but for the sake of segmentation, a reset is taking place, which in Hebrew is often achieved by overspecifying the reference to that participant. So low accessibility, maybe I should say, is not exactly the same as not predictable or less predictable, but it's more in terms of accessibility. Low accessibility is more in terms of it's harder for the hearer because of the reset to process who the participant is. So that um, triggers over-specification of the reference to that participant. Then I come to um, the strategy of verb forms, um, where there is a, a contrast between default and marked as well. Um, default um, 
is in the case of um, yiktol and vayiktol, when there is proximity involved, and in a nutshell, and I know this is a very quick summary, in a nutshell, um, this means that the action expressed by the yiktol or the vayiktol is tightly linked to the current text and speech situation as shared between um, speaker and addressee, as opposed to non-proximity, in the case of katal, the katal, and koteu, where that action is loosely, only loosely linked to the current text and speech situation as shared by the addressee. So yiktol by yiktol in this approach would be default, katal by katal koteu uh, would be marked. This is a lot together in a nutshell, so I thought the following chart might be of some help. Um, and what you see here is that um, several factors contribute to how the verbs function in Hebrew. In a nutshell, um, aspect and modality uh, are mentioned on the left, while the difference between non-sequential and sequential is mentioned on the top. I think that's helpful, but in, in addition to that, I find the di distinction between proximate and non-proximate or yiktol, bayiktol indicating proximity of that action to the addressee, and katal, the katal, koteo, indicating non-proximity of the action to the addressee, in the estimation of the speaker. I find it helpful to introduce that distinction into the picture as well. Um, to explain, because I think it's important and interesting to explain the verb in its own right. Why this verb form and not another? And I've listed some examples here where I think that this distinction between proximity and non-proximity may be helpful because there are some interesting cases where um, in different contexts, what seems to be the same statement has, comes with a different verb. For example, in Genesis 4 verse 1, it says, um, and the man knew his wife, uh, um, and um, that comes with a katal, yada, whereas a very similar statement, and Adam knew his wife again in 4.25, comes with the vayiktol, even though both verses are, I think, foreground, it's interesting to see that in verse one there's a katal, in 25 there is a vayiktol. I think this can be explained in terms of, in verse one, the whole action of knowing his wife is still completely non-proximate, whereas also with the word again in 25, the action, this kind of action has become proximate in the estimation of the speaker, concerning the mind of the addressee. Genesis 18.13, as opposed to 24.31. In Genesis 18.13, um, it says, there is the question, why did Sarah laugh? It's a kata, uh, That question is to the addressee, Abraham, a non-proximate thing to ask. Uh, Sarah was aware of the laughing, of course, uh, the visitor or the Lord was aware of the laughing, but Abraham was at that point still blissfully unaware of it. So to him, in the mind of the speaker, the action of Sarah's laughing is non-proximate, hence the kata. This comes in contrast to the yikto for a very similar question in Genesis 24-31, where Laban asks the servant of Abram who, who is coming to visit uh, to find a wife for the son, where Laban is asking, why do you stand outside the Amot, Yikto? And in that context, it is clear from what precedes that both people, Laban and the servant, realize that the servant is standing there outside and waiting. So in that context, to both parties, the, 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 the action of standing is proximate. So the Yikto is, is important there. Then I move on to um, several the um, which in my thinking 
refer to non-proximate uh, actions, as I said. And it's interesting that there are a number of katals uh, here um, that come after, but also instead of the vayektol you would expect. So the vayektols would be proximate, and it would be natural progression and sequentiality of the actions. But then there comes an action which is indicated with a verkatal to dissociate that action from what preceded. I should quote what it says there in Genesis 21, 25. In, in the wider context, there is of course um, the um, successful negotiation between Abraham and uh, Abimelech. But then it says in 25, but Abraham did complain, verkatal, to Abimelech um, about a well of water which the servants of Abimelech had seized. So you could translate that literally and say, and Abraham complained as if it's the next logical step or course of action after preceding steps that Abraham took. But I think that would be unfair in English to, to, to translate it like that. Instead, there is a Vekatal. The action of Vekatal is non-proximate, is dissociated from the more predictable uh, and expected negotiations that seem to go very well, but here suddenly, unexpectedly, there is an action of complaint. So uh, a rendering, by the way, in English like, but Abraham did complain, or what in biblical Hebrew is only the katal, would be helpful. Genesis 15, 6, of course, a very well-known text. Um, he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, um, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, this is part of a longer dialogue between uh, the Lord and Abram. But after and instead of the various vayektols that we've had, at this point, when it says, and he believed the Lord, the Ha'anim, um, there um, we have uh, the katal instead of what might have been possible, the vayektol. And I think this choice of the katal has something to do with dissociating this action from the natural progression of what preceded. Um, something similar in Isaiah 6, 3, the katal, um, it's of course the, the well-known passage where Isaiah is called to be a prophet and uh, the seraphim appear and there are various vayektols and uh, yiktols and um, that all in that scene, everything is in a way proximate. But then suddenly you might say it says, the uh, amar, ze and ze, and it says, and one called to another and said. So uh, one called to another is the katal, biblical Hebrew, um, and I think after that scene, kind of unexpectedly, certainly to Isaiah, I would have thought uh, there is an unexpected action, non-proximate, uh, unexpected. So uh, the calling uh, of one seraph, one seraph to another uh, in a way is not just part of the opening scene, but is the next step a surprising next step and thereby dissociated from the preceding actions. Um, these examples, I think, are interesting in themselves, but they also point to a more general question about what we should think about the Burkatal. Um, I think in general, in, in the field, we often tend to think of Burkatal as a verb form which itself doesn't have that much individuality. It seems to be able to come after nearly any other type of verb form. And it seems to be continuing uh, a preceding verb form by the katals being chained onto and after it. I don't want to kind of push that off the table entirely at all, but I just think that examples like these, where katal does not simply continue the preceding actions, because that is what Bayektol could have done here, but instead the Vakatal seems to dissociate this action in uh, making it stand apart from the preceding ones, uh, 
that I think the Qatar does have an individuality of its own, which I think we can um, understand better in terms of, of non-proximity. So I think these examples have a wider relevance. Um, segmentation criteria. Um, I already mentioned discontinuity, starting a new paragraph as a reset so that the text wants to look at participant reference and specifically fully referring to the participant again. Um, I mentioned discontinuity in terms of marked word order where the verb comes second only after a preceding nominal constituent, um, for example. So looking at segmentation criteria, and not segmentation being another obvious case of discontinuity, the question that uh, is often asked, how do you define a paragraph? What is a paragraph? How, on what ground uh, do you decide a new paragraph starts? I think there are two approaches to that in answer to that question, and I think we need both. Um, but for the sake of objectivity, it's good to start with the syntactic criteria for discontinuity first. So when a construction stands out from its context syntactically by means of a marked participant reference or by means of a marked verb or by means of a marked word order. Um, and when that discontinuity is visible, is present in the Hebrew of the text itself, then I think we have a fairly objective criterion there for segmentation and saying, this is how we can define the start of a new paragraph. But I must admit, it's also helpful to look at non-syntactic segmentation criteria, um, as long as we are aware that these are not as visible and formally marked sometimes as the syntactic criteria. Non-syntactic criteria for segmentation being discontinuity because of a change of participants or a change in time, a change in place or action. In other words, changes to the reader's orientation, which of course triggers a reset, triggers segmentation. These criteria might be more subjective. In practice as translators, we sometimes need these non-syntactic criteria too, I must admit. For example, in, um, to some extent in the Balaam narrative, but certainly in Numbers 16, the whole narrative about uh, Korach, Datan, and Abiram, their rebellion against Moses and the priests. Um, if you were to look for the syntactic segmentation moments in that whole chapter, you will find very few of them as a translator. So that's really the practical question. What can a translator do there? If he is to segment or apply segmentation to a chapter like that, he will have to take some recourse to non-syntactic criteria like in the, chain, in the case of um, numbers 16, change of participants. In other words, in general, changes to the readers or the addressees orientation. So in translation, making the question or the issue more general, when we, how do we define a paragraph? We have syntactic criteria, we have non-syntactic criteria. We probably need both, but we should be very careful to distinguish the two and not just mix them up. Drew, from, as far as I'm concerned, it's time for our intermission, right? Before we move I, on to Balaam. Yes, I think you have triggered a new segment um, and it's time for a Vekital. If we had Vekitals in English, I think this would be a perfect time to bring one out so we could okay. disassociate ourselves, if you will, yes. from what precedes, so we could launch a new episode. Now, one of the questions that I like to ask all of our webinar guests is, who from antiquity, Lenart, would you most like to sit down with for a chat? Okay, Drew, uh, the screen is still being shared. Do you want to have the regular video? No, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, okay. So I'm just continuing to share my screen, um, stopping here for a moment. Um, the, um, the problem is that the, the people I would want to sit down with for a chat in antiquity 
don't always have a name. At least we don't always have their, their name anymore. But um, it would be wonderful to sit down with uh, at least some of the Septuagint translator and um, discuss with them um, their translator's creativity and mm -hmm. their translator's strategy for us now to understand better uh, whether insofar, yeah, to which extent we can make a distinction between um, what we see in the Septuagint as the representative of genuine textual variation mm -hmm. in comparison with our Hebrew text as opposed to um, perhaps not textual variation in terms of textual criticism, but a great and wonderful translation strategy on the part of the Septuagint translator and draw parallels between what they did and what we find ourselves having to do. Mm -hmm. But um, at least one of them has a name. It's the, the grandson of uh, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, Sirach, so uh, Ben Sirach, who translated his grandfather's work from, from Hebrew into Greek. And um, I would want to yeah, ask him a few questions about um, his introduction to his grandfather's work, um, because he wrote, of course, what we can consider um, one of the first, maybe the first translation briefs in translation history, which I've put on the screen here. Mm -hmm. As you well know, he wrote in his introduction that for what was originally expressed in Hebrew does not have exactly the same sense when translated into another language. Not only this book, but even the law itself, the prophecies and the rest of the books differ not a little when read in the original. There are some assumptions behind this statement, which we can sense. And I'm sure there are some assumptions behind this statement, which we no longer can sense in particular. Mm -hmm. And it would be great to 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 ask him in person. Yes. Yes. No. I I really like that. Yes. So what century would have? So what century are we talking about here? With uh, so this was um, uh, second century, late second century BC. Second century BC. All right. So even then, we have somebody talking about the translating the sense versus translating the form. I mean. Um, That's right. You have, yeah. yeah, like this guy here, you know, this guy here, Jerome came under a lot of fire for translating um, the sense, but I often talked about translating the Hebrew truth. So that's what we want yes. as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Second um, discontinuity now. Um, tell us, please, Lenart, what is one idea in Bible translation that just needs to go away? If you had the power to click your fingers and make it disappear, what do we need to stop repeating, thinking or saying? Um, the, the way in which we approach uh, key terms in translation, I find sometimes is increasingly becoming a matter of automatic checking in paratext, for example. So this is not to blame paratext, it's our responsibility how we use it, of course. Um, but sometimes in, in the way we set up projects um, and also in the way scholars think sometimes about uh, the need to translate key terms consistently and in the same way all the way through. It stimulates automatic looking at key terms, uh, being set on getting rid of all the variation mm. without taking uh, enough into account the immediate contexts of these key terms and especially how certain key terms uh, tend to be used in one particular corpus or in one particular book in the bible we tend to look at the whole old testament in one go forgetting the variation between books and the idea the possibility that what seems the same term may have a slightly different meaning overall for for example the author of samuel kings as opposed to the author of chronicles or Zera in Genesis in particular, the example uh, I gave a few moments ago about Hagar, that um, I think we are getting rid of some variation in, in how to translate these terms 
a bit too much. That that would be uh, a danger that that I see. Um, it's stimulated by all the instruments we have, like Paratext, but that, as I said, is obviously obviously not an excuse. With all the instruments we have, we can still ask ourselves the question: um, what we can do to to um, translate terms in such a way that justice is done to how these terms function in one particular book, for example. So I put some of that on, on this particular slide. And then, of course, there is, but that I admit is much more my hobby horse, stop translating Hebrew word order literally. Uh, mm. Our friend in the field, Robert Alter, seems to be a strong advocate of translating Hebrew word order literally. And what I think of course, there wasn't enough time to go into all the details, but I think I've tried to show in terms of word order that what seems to be the same word order, sometimes marked word order, noun first, verb second, sometimes indicates basis plus new information. At other times, when an alternative needs to be ruled out, it indicates contrastive focus plus the rest. And that difference is completely obliterated in, in uh, alters translation when he translates Hebrew word order literally and then it may look fine in English but I think it's still misleading. Mm. Yeah. Okay so what you're saying in fact is that we do need to alter the word order. Exactly yes. that sounds okay. a very good uh, way of putting it yeah. No that was that was from my colleague Harry. I just <laughs> Um, well, what I would love from now is I would I promise these folks that we would saddle our donkeys and go on a guided tour of the Bil'am narrative. Are you willing to help us hit some hot spots in numbers in um, in the, these intriguing narratives and oracles and just just take us by the hand and show us where some of these features come out. Show us how um, the, the Balaam narrative is coherent, if you will, please. OK, thank you. Yeah, we'll try not to be stopped in our tracks by the donkey or the angel or Balak. So let's go to the Balaam narrative. Yes, um, um, Drew already supplied us with a lovely and, and kind of almost comic picture of Balaam on, on the donkey and the angel stops him. And um, well, um, at some point I also felt it was nice to, to produce this picture of Balaam. Um, this is how he appears on the outside of uh, the cathedral in Ciudad Rodrigo in, in Spain. Um, and of course, um, he interestingly has an attribute he carries to scroll like other prophets, which interestingly shows what the sculptor uh, or his commissioners thought about Balaam in the first place. And of course, the star of um, Jacob is on his head. Okay, that's one way to introduce our main character. Of course, we can continue. Um, here we come to um, what is already happening in chapter 22. Um, I need to move something here. Okay. Um, sorry, on my screen, something's in the way. Yeah, it should work. Um, in chapter 22, five and six, uh, Balak or his messengers, invite Balaam to come with them and put these curses uh, on, on this strange people. Um, in um, verse 10 and 11, he, um, sorry, yeah, in verse 10 and 11, um, this, this invitation is actually quoted by Balaam in Balaam's own conversation with God during the night. And the red parts in particular, uh, when you compare the two passages, show that Balaam is not making the quotation verbatim. And um, in general, we can say um, that this means um, that, that in, in, in Balaam's account of what was said to him, Balaam distances himself from Balak's perspective. He reduces Balak's perspective somewhat and he distances himself from it. That's a general observation. But then uh, moving on to the details, um, in um, verse 5b, so that's the top left of the screen again, 
we see the people has come out. There is a uh, just um, it's still indefinite, and come out is a katal. I would say that's non proximate. And then originally in the invitation, um, um, Balak continues with non proximity, with chissa, it covers katal, non proximate, the face of the earth, and so on. So there's quite a bit of non proximity. Uh, in what Balak originally said, um, the way he speaks about it to his addressee. Okay, let's now compare that with um, um, Balaam's version of this, uh, the way he uh, relates this uh, to God. Interestingly, um, it's not Am, but Ha'am, the people. It's not Yatsa, but Hayotse, participle, that has come out. I think non-proximity is still continuing here. I realize also that, that um, um, there's a lot of text critical discussion about Hayotse here and Ha'am. Uh, some ancient versions read something else here. Um, and it would be interesting in, in more detail to explore to what extent this should be a text critical discussion and to which extent this should be uh, kind of discussion we are having right now about looking at how the verbs are used as part of the linguistic uh, coherence achievement. Um, not surprisingly, I favor or tend to put emphasis on the latter, the, the discussion of the linguistic forms and the linguist towards the linguistic coherence first. And then secondly, we will see if uh, any text critical problem arises or not. I don't think it does. I think we can really read uh, um, I would say. Okay, having said that, um, it's interesting that the non proximity is replaced by uh, proximity in the next sentence. Uh, covers instead of covers chisa the katal in um, the original uh, invitation from Balak. Um, and it's very interesting, and, and here perhaps I, I can make a reference to uh, one of the points raised by Dr. Stephen Levinson in, 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 in the questions that I received. Um, he very correctly pointed out uh, an inconsistency um, in my treatment of uh, verse 10b, uh, the participle I would say, uh, and the rest in my uh, habilitation of 2016, um, where indeed uh, it could easily be read that sentence as if uh, I suddenly refer to everything, including the participle, as proximate. Um, I'm happy to say that in, in, in uh, the published extended version of that thesis of 2019, um, I made the correction and I'm referring only to Weichas, the Weichtol, as proximate, not to the participle. I think it is indeed fair to say that um, I would say uh, at the beginning of this um, version by Balaam is still proximate, sorry, non proximate, even though soon um, in Balaam's version things develop further into proximity. Um, the um, another issue in this passage, uh, in these two passages, when you compare them, is, um, and this I think is also where Balaam's distance from Balak's own perspective uh, becomes apparent. Um, it's interesting to compare. Perhaps I shall succeed in the top left, uh, the original words of Balak messengers perhaps I shall succeed that we may defeat it and I may drive out of drive it out of the land um, that is still um, a vehicle proximate and that has become the uh, Katal uh, bottom right and drive it out um, and I think there maybe in line with my examples from Genesis where I think that the Katal does not always lose its individuality, but can play a role in marking dissociation 
from preceding events and thereby to the addressee make the action non-proximate. I think something like that is happening here as well. It needs further thinking, but to my mind, uh, the fact that you have a vukatal at the end in verse 11, in contrast to the vyiktol in the top left, the original um, invitation from Balak, I find it significant. And I think we need to explain it in terms of not losing um, a verb type, losing its individuality, but in terms of um, changing from proximity to non-proximity in the way Balam sees it. Let's continue with uh, some uh, examples of participant reference or over-specification of reference of participant the way they are referred to. In other words, where pronouns might have been enough, he and her or he and him, and where instead you do see full reference to Balaam or full reference to the donkey or full reference to the angel of uh, Adonai. Um, yeah, I think these are cases where, of course, they are marked. It still needs further explanation what's going to, what's happening here. I think what we are having here is unexpectedness expressed, contrast, um, in term, unexpectedness in terms of what these uh, participants say or what they do. And then, um, as in most of Hebrew narrative, there are lots of examples of such uh, over-specification, I believe. And of course, in, in, in many target languages in, in which we all work, um, the question is how could such contrast be expressed? Because in most cases, I think it will be the case that if we simply say, and Balaam said to the donkey, and the donkey said to Balaam, and Balaam said to the angel, and the angel said to Balaam, it, it simply sounds repetitive in English. It doesn't express any contrast. I think in translation, it would be justified to use um, markers of, of contrast. What are in English in this case, that's the receptor language, markers of contrast, for example, but um, that works, I think, very well in a target language like English. Um, and um, so the idea that where Hebrew uses over-specification as a marked participant reference in order to point to contrast to unexpectedness, other languages will express that contrast perhaps in a different way. And then we should make use of it in order not to lose that information that unexpectedness is going on here. So in some target languages, contrastive markers or particles um, would have to be used. Here is again interesting to, to pick up on a point that, that uh, Dr. Stephen Levinson uh, has raised, I think on several occasions, which is that where you have over-specification over in, in the reference to participants, um, in order to mark the start of a new paragraph, uh, a new stage, a new action, in other words, in my terms, segmentation, there is a reset. Those are moments where the Hebrew does it in that way, over-specification, and where lots of other languages would use development markers like then or so or so then to achieve the same thing. Um, so all in all, just saying that Literal translation will not help us usually to translate what we think is being done in Hebrew through over-specification. But in other languages, we need these things are likely to be expressed sometimes with development markers or in the case of unexpectedness expressed by over-specification by participant reference with cont contrastive markers. On the point of, of development markers in Hebrew, uh, that may, may be a slight digression. Um, um, I think in general, it's fair to say indeed that, that you could say, does Hebrew have any development markers at all? And this is almost a rhetorical question. On the whole, I think the answer is indeed no. Although we could also think of words like 
hine we hine atta we atta uh, as maybe not as conjunctions as particles marking a development in the text as well so development markers in some way are not completely absent from hebrew but in but it's very true in terms of conjunctions like so the way development markers are used in in, in english and in greek for example um, that is something that is indeed nearly absent from 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 hebrew it's not systematically recurring all the time the way it does in english for example let's continue with um, um, what is happening um, and here, thanks to Drew, I could uh, un, uh, enlighten my slide with a nice picture. Um, going back to word order issues, um, contrastive focus, I think in 2232 is um, expressed by having anochi before the finite verb um, and um, the angel is saying to, to Balaam, ruling out the alternative that the donkey would have barred uh, Balaam from continuing, it is me, the angel, who is barring you, stopping you from continuing. As you see, French is a language where uh, it, French has this wonderful device of using cleft uh, constructions like it is I who, c'est moi qui, uh, who has that sort of construction at its disposal um, to mark contrastive focus. Uh, it looks a bit different from Hebrew, but the function I think is very similar. Contrastive focus on that constituent in order to rule out the alternative. Um, when you look at French translations in, back to that example, Isaiah 53 verse four, uh, you see a lot of se, mm -hmm, ki, se nuki, uh, and so on. Uh, that kind of cleft uh, construction is used quite often in, in a place like Isaiah 53 verse 4 in French translations as well. Another example is, um, uh, of course, on the screen 2233, um, where this ruling out the alternative continues from the mouth of uh, the angel of the Lord to Bale and thereby creating this marked word order of putting gam, otcha, and otach before the verb, which comes second. Um, around Balaam's oracles, you see uh, a kind of fairly regular structure, which uh, Ernst Wendland and I have explored a bit further in, in the translator's handbook on, on numbers. So this is essentially a summary of that part of what we try to explain there. Around each of the first three oracles, the narratives begin with a problem, followed by a build-up intention, a, a peak point then at the oracle itself, and then a denouement. And then we don't have time for all the details now, of course, it's very interesting to, to observe that, that although this is the general structure that is being repeated around these oracles, you can still see that the way in which the build-up intention is achieved is not always the same uh, before each and every oracle. There are some interesting smaller, smaller specific differences under the more general umbrella of this overall structure before and after these first three oracles. Looking in detail at uh, inside the first oracle then, um, because it's very tempting to look at how the Balaam narrative develops as a narrative, um, but of course I should not forget to look at some of the wisdom in the uh, oracles themselves. 23.7, um, um, Min Aram Yan Geni Balak. Balak brought me from Aram. Now, almost predictably, Robert Alter says, he has here, from Aram did Balak lead me. I think Alter gives the wrong suggestion. It suggests in English, I think, that Balak led me not from this or that country, but from Aram in particular. I don't think the Hebrew rules out alternatives. I think Min Aram is rather the basis, the contextualizing uh, constituent after which the main information, namely that uh, Bala brought me is given. 
um, then 23.9, um, from the top of the mountains, I see him again in terms of um, uh, the structure of that sentence, the word order. I tend to think that, although in English, probably from the top of the mountains, I see him sounds more elevated in style or more poetical or something in terms of the linguistic structure of that sentence. I think um, the point is not um, that Balaam says, it is only from the top of the mountains and from nowhere else that I see him. The point is rather that in the context, the basis of the top of the mountains, I see him uh, and that I see him er ennu, is actually the new, the main information. And the same parallel observation we can make um, for uh, the rest of that verse. By the way, although this is largely about uh, sorry, this is of course mostly about um, these two examples that there is no contrastive focus, no alternatives have to be ruled out, but instead it's the sentence starts with the basis, the contextualizing constituent after which the new information comes. Um, as an aside, it's inter interesting to mention here in 23.9 that um, we have something similar to what I would call delayed identification. In terms of participant reference, I've spent some time discussing over specifications. Here, perhaps, we have the opposite, at least initially under specification. It's interesting. It may be due to the poetry, but I think it can be done in prose as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's interesting that initially this participant, whoever he or it is, is only referred to with phenomenal suffixes. It's only a bit later that the participant is referred to as um, the people. It would, from a poetic point of view, as it were, be much less interesting, if not more boring, to say something like, I see a people from the top of the mountains. That would be possible, but it's interesting that the Hebrew does not do that. The actual identification of this mysterious, dangerous participants in the eyes of Balak at least. Uh, it's interesting that this identification of that participant is uh, as it were postponed. So it's I think a case of initial unspecification. But well, that's uh, a brief digression. Let's move on to um, 24 verse 9. Again an example of marked word order in order to rule out an alternative. So I think that's contrastive focus on uh, and on It is the one who blesses you that is blessed, nobody else. It is the one who curses you that is cursed, nobody else. And um, nobody else is um, a significant thing to add or think here because you might expect um, that um, the party who receives the blessing is blessed, or the party who is cursed is cursed. But instead, at least here, in contrast to earlier places in, 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 in the narrative, uh, the um, focus is, and because an, an alternative is ruled out, its contrastive focus is on the one who blesses you, the blesser, and the one who curses you, the cursor. And I find it interesting that although the two translations are centuries apart and on paper had different translation briefs maybe the vulgate in latin and the dutch bible in plain language which appeared less than 10 years ago do something very similar here the vulgate has who will bless you will himself be blessed and the dutch uh, of eight years ago has he who blesses the israelites is blessed himself again, but he who curses them will be cursed himself. In other words, it's a way of saying um, the blesser himself um, um, will be blessed and the cursor himself will be cursed. Contrastive focus on those two. Um, on this slide, I've worked that out in a bit more detail, what I just said. Um, finally, um, because I've hardly talked about um, uh, 
terms, how they function. Um, I mean, being very critical of how in the field we tend to, to treat key terms. Uh, I should give at least one more example of how it might be more constructive to look at how terms uh, are used in a particular corpus, in this case, in, in, in the Balaam narrative. Um, and I think it's interesting to observe that um, um, in 2411b, um, um, it is said, look, the Lord has held you back from honor. Mena'acha. It's a, a katal, but at the moment I'm mostly interested in, in the actual choice of uh, the lexical uh, choice made here, because it's a kind of uh, echo, echo of that verb in uh, when it was mentioned earlier in 22 verse 16. Um, because ba what Balak Balaam, sorry, what Balaam achieves in 2411 is actually the opposite uh, when he says, the Lord has held you back from honor. What Balaam achieved is the opposite of what Balak had in mind earlier in 2216, when Balak said, pray, do not hold back uh, al na timana from going to me. So, um, in addition to all the discussions we could have about the constructions here, I also find it interesting that there is lexical cohesion uh, to which mana'acha and timmana both contribute the lexical cohesion in this narrative. Uh, so this is another contributing factor to um, linguistic coherence. Thank you very much. That reaches the end of my presentation for the moment. No, en fait, c'est moi qui vous remercie. C'est moi qui vous remercie. Yes, vous indeed. Vous... <laughs> Remerciement partagé. Um, yes, very good. Um, we're going to continue with some question and answer. Lenart, thank you so much. That was outstanding. Um, would you like to cease um, sharing your screen? Or perhaps maybe you want to bring another slide up? I don't know. but. I'm seeing here. In no, I'll, the... I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll always bring it back if it's needed. Maybe that's good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Here in the question and answer box, um, we've had several people submit questions related to this idea of proximity. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think it's still unclear in some attendees' minds what we mean, or what do you mean when you talk about things that are proximate and non proximate? Just to like boil it down, really simple. Um, okay, so the the, the question was, um, um, yeah, it's part of. In the text, the sentence is continue. The um, the speaker estimates where the address, where the addressee is in terms of what information the addressee has, what information the addressee presupposes, not only from the text, but from his reality in general too. And the speaker is making corrections or additions to that time and time again. So the speaker is estimating the action I'm going to talk about will be close to what the addressee already knows, will not be so close to what the addressee already knows. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I'm thinking when the speaker estimates that the uh, addressee, that the action that he's going to talk about is already quite close, not far away from what the addressee presupposes and knows already, then the speaker decides he can use approximate form like by ICTO or ICTO. And when the um, speaker estimates that the action he is going to specify is much more loosely linked much further from the uh, view of reality, uh, the information that the addressee has. And when, especially when the speaker thinks he needs to make a real correction there, then several marked things will happen mm -hmm. with regard to the verbs the speaker will probably decide to use non-proximate forms like katal, katal, kotel, and 
he is also likely to come up with uh, a marked word order because in a situation where the speaker decides he has to offer a lot of new information, unexpected information, it's very likely that not just the action of the verb, but indeed other parts of the sentence, like ruling out, having to rule out an alternative, will trigger the marked word order. So in that way, and that makes it slightly more general than only discussing the distinction proximity, non-proximity for verbs. In that way, uh, I think approaching it like that, it enables me, it enables us to explain the choice of verb in the sentence in its own right, to explain the marked word order in the sentence in its own right. They are each signs of discontinuity, if you like, um, of the need for a reset. Um, and then together, these factors contribute to the linguistic coherence of the text at that point. Right. OK, good. Yes, I, I often think of it in terms of a mental representation. If I'm picturing a restaurant, um, mm -hmm. the idea of a waiter or waitress coming up to my table is perhaps proximate. It's, it's something I would expect. Like I would expect a waiter or a waitress to come up to my table if I'm in a restaurant. But yes. now if I'm telling a story about being in a restaurant and then all of a sudden a bear, the yes. animal, a bear, approaches my table, well, that's something unexpected. And you might say, all of a sudden, look, can you believe it? All of a sudden, a bear shows up. You know, that that's non-proximate. So one is the, the, the hearer is not expecting. And so it's not as close in my mental representation of, of a restaurant scene. I don't know. That's kind of how I think about it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's yeah. helpful for the attendee. Um, and so following on from that, a related question from Dr. David Hogg was, does this idea of proximity, do you see that this applies um, even in poetry, in the Psalms, for example, or is this something that most re mostly relates to prose? Um, I think it relates to poetry as well. At least in, in an earlier article, I have attempted, and I have to leave it to others, whether it was a successful attempt. Of course, I'm biased. I think it was fairly successful to try and apply this distinction to um, poetry as well, or particularly, that's not maybe not exactly the same as poetry all the time, but to um, prophecy, yes, where I think it, it works as well. Yeah, okay. because of course we, we often tend to think at least that we understand narratives text better. That's why it may feel easier to, to see and work with this distinction. Um, of course, the, the other genres are harder to understand and, and interpret in any case. So that's why, that's why it feels trickier and not so certain to work with a distinction like this. But I still think it works. And I would still say that for poetry and, and prophecy, um, it's not as if suddenly, because there is poetry, the grammar of the language suddenly changes and goes out of the window, is replaced by something else. I would rather say that in poetry or prophecy, uh, it is even more apparent that the author makes, for textual purposes, a very particular use of the uh, linguistic possibilities that the language gives him. OK, yes. And um, what was the, what's the, can you give us more information on the article um, on prophecy that you referenced? Um, it, it, that, that's on my uh, Academia page. It's an article from, uh, that goes back to 2008. It was, was published in Journal of Northwest Semitic Languages. Um, and uh, yeah, Hebrew verb forms in prose and in some poetic and prophetic passages. So okay. even the title suggests that I was daring, maybe over daring, but I think it's a fruitful approach. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And do you want to, um, Dr. Levinson here has a, a question about um, over specification. Do you want to address that Indeed. briefly? Yeah. Do you want to address that briefly and perhaps just summarize his All question? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Dr. Levinson, thanks so much for, for raising these questions. Um, and bringing them to the fore, uh, 
all the questions, but also the over-specification question has, has helped me in, in the last round of, of doing some preparation for, for this presentation today. And just, yes, just to um, briefly summarize the question that he, he put to me concerning over-specification. It's about um, numbers um, 22, verse 14 and 21. And in numbers 22, verse 14 and 21, in both cases, uh, I wrote, I have to say, both in the 2016 and in the uh, 2019 version of my work, that at that point, um, the overspecification marks the end of a paragraph. And then um, the, uh, and then Stephen Levison, he writes, um, However, it's cross-linguistically normal to mark in some way the transition from a speech or conversation, because before these verses there is conversation, to mark the transition uh, in some way from a speech or conversation to a non-speech event that begins in 14 and 21, that results from it. Hebrew uses over-specification, English uses so. Um, it's illustrated in 14, where the Good News Bible replaces the overt reference to the leaders of Moab with the appropriate equivalent in English. So, development marker, they, just the pronoun instead of the leaders of Moab. Um, so again, that brings together the observation that um, where a new paragraph starts in Hebrew and it's indicated with over-specification there in a lot of target languages, including English, you would expect that to be done starting a new paragraph with the help of a development marker instead of a full over-specification. Um, yeah, I looked at it again and I think, I think you're right that it is more helpful in 14 and 21 to say uh, a new paragraph is starting rather than the existing paragraph is ending. So if that is indeed the case, you can say in 14 and 21, over specification, a new paragraph is starting. And that's a moment where in other languages, you might want to use a development marker like so. I still have a general question. So not just in these two cases where I think you're right that it is probably better to just say a new paragraph is starting. But it brings me to a general question, not just for me, but for all of us when we engage in, in the field of Hebrew discourse studies. I think there is a tendency again, and it's understandable because it's complicated enough to work it all out um, when we analyze these texts. Um, when does a new paragraph start? How do we define a paragraph? How do we know and see that uh, a new paragraph is starting? And we are really focused on that. And indeed, so it should be. At the same time, and I at least should spend more time thinking about it, uh, there is the question, in reality, also in life, and we have a conversation, the way we feel the conversation is reaching its, its end, or when you watch a film, the way you feel the film is ending, that moment comes before something new starts. You know that the film is ending, you sense it before the program on TV is finished. You sense the end of a conversation before the conversation actually finishes and something completely new starts. So there is something in the linguistic coherence of texts that marks in ways that we still need to explore further that the end of a unit, the end of a paragraph, or the end of the text or the narrative is coming. And the linguistic parts of that um, is something that I think I would want to explore further. And I think it's a research question for, 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 for all of us. But back to the details of 22, 14 and 21, I think it is indeed fruitful to say that uh, a new paragraph is starting there because both for the reason of, of over-specification, so that's marked syntactically, if you like, and also, as uh, Dr. Levinson was pointing out in this question, uh, because there are uh, some changes, like change of time and place, um, which I then would classify under the non-syntactic, but still valid ways, criteria for marking segmentation. Um, I think 
that is a fair um, quotation and response of his question concerning um, overspecification. Um, and I was, it was good to see again um, the comparison that he makes, that Dr. Levinson makes with um, development markers as a translation strategy or a kind of equivalent in a receptor language like English, which I would use also but then for then mentioning contrastive markers, markers of contrast, conjunctions of particles of contrast as a natural equivalent in a language like English, a natural equivalent to those overspecifications that mark contrast, emphasis, unexpectedness, right. like starting such a sentence with but. Excellent. We have the, the, the question and answer section is just a flurry of a beehive of wondrous activity that I am just, I, I'm just in awe of the wonderful questions coming in. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, we want to be mindful of our, of our special guest time. Lenart, thank you so much. I've invited my dear friend, Linnell. Linnell, are you there? Yes. Can you hear All me? Right. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead? I think you were going to make sure that we profusely thank our special guest, as well as we'd like to take a moment to uh, pray over him and just ask the Lord to continue to bless his ministry um, in what he's doing in the field of linguistics and Bible translation. So Linnell, take it away. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay, great. Hello. Hi. Um, hi, Leonard. Hello to all, and hi, Leonard, and thank you so much for this excellent talk, which we've so much appreciated. I Drew asked me to pray, and I said, no, I, before I pray, then I have to say a few words. So these are my few words. I am very encouraged to see how you're bringing together uh, language as a system for Biblical Hebrew and how you're combining uh, different linguistic signals and processes to explain um, the meaning of text. So I really appreciate uh, that approach. It surprises me that linguistics now is coming back into the forefront of exegesis and of our translation issues. And it almost makes me laugh because as a former SIL and, and now UBS and almost for, former UBS, sometimes we've gotten away from these linguistic analyses, but listening to you underlines to me how much we need to analyze not just Hebrew and Greek, but the target languages we're working in. If we don't do that, we won't be able to translate. Absolutely. So I just wanted to thank you again for bringing so many elements together. And I think this is can be a real breakthrough for a lot of us. And since Drew asked me to pray, I decided to read um, a prayer from Numbers 624. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. That is Amen. beautiful. Yes. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. We hope to have the recording up shortly that you can share with others who were not in attendance. Again, Lenart, there's so much to process here. I look forward to reading my Hebrew Bible with new lenses on, um, looking at the text in a different way, exploring ways um, that I've missed um, these coherence devices in the past. Um, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Everybody should go out and buy a copy of Lenart's book. 
um, Linguistic Coherence in Biblical Hebrew Texts, published by Gorgias Press in 2019. Is that right? So just a year That's old. Right. Yes. So, um, right. so this is somewhat of a one-year uh, anniversary birthday party for your book being published. Um, thank you so much for um, all your preparation and your, your presentation. Just a wonderful time. So we're going to say goodbye for now. Um, normally, my colleague Harry and I, we stick around and just kind of, I don't know, shoot the breeze. But you are free to go, Lenart, or you can stay around and shoot the breeze with us. We're going to go ahead and um, uh, stop the recording.